So in I'm pretty bought into the North American <laughs> model of wildlife management. And a big part of that seems to be non-professional hunting used as a tool for conservation to, you know, in a in the animal rights ideal, you know, utopian vision of nature, there's no management needed because humans aren't don't play a role in that. I think in the real world, uh, we have to play a role and there is no sort of prelapsarian ideal state where the lions just exist without us anymore. Uh, and a lot of your book is sort of navigating that mm -hmm. conflict. Uh, is uh, non-professional hunting a tool for conservation uh, of lions? There, I was a little bit confused because it's at a certain point, I thought you were saying that lions kind of self limit their population yep, yep. and that there's not good evidence that hunting is a useful tool for predator management. It, it, yeah. So lion hunting is clearly, um, you know, one of the primary tools to manage lion populations in the West, but it depends on what we as people want. And it depends on the state you live in. And frankly, the hunting district you live in where legal hunting occurs, if it does, and depending upon what society's interests are to, you know, unhunted to really hunted hard for mountain lions or any species for that matter, then seasons have to be created to meet that demand. So, yeah, at, you know, lion, it, but the, so, yeah, lions do self-regulate, right? The tribes some to hear uh, don't hunt lions. They have some uh, cultural values and their densities hit a top, right? Mm -hmm. And, and they disperse, but you know, you're not going to stack lines in like pancakes. They're behaviorally limited to some degree. Right. Um, but if you look at natural populations, uh, Kenny Logan and Linda Swainer, they did, you know, 15 years in New Mexico and we compared the mortality they had in an unhunted population with the Garnett population here in Montana by Missoula. And it's almost the same amount of animals, interestingly removed by legal hunting in Montana versus natural mortality that occurred in mm. New Mexico. Point is, you know, there's a big pie, a piece of that pie, a big circle, and a wedge. The wedge of removal uh, in a unhunted population was almost exactly the same as a hunted population. So cats are going to die no matter what. There's not a utopian, death-free state that lions live in. However, in the hunted populations, you can overhunt them by killing too many females. And if that's a goal, then absolutely, it works real easy. But you got to be careful with female take. I, you know, they have to be, you know, usually, you know, a couple of years old to have kittens every every 18 months, sometimes a little less. But uh, and they got to stay with mom, you know, close to 18 months. It, it's not like a deer, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So Something I found really uplifting in your book, uh, although it's tempered with, you know, the past uh, wrong, you know, wrong decisions that we've made in terms of wildlife management and the environment is that there's a sort of shame in the greenie movement as to which views humans as destroyers of the environment and solely these negative forces and yeah. it just solely it, only in the numbers alone i think you the positive direction of lion populations as they spread uh, yeah. as they spread uh says something good about how our relationship could be uh with the natural world mm -hmm. D do you see uh that shame in the environmental movement. Uh, I talked with Hal Herring and he said that's uh, it's it's the uh, how he sees himself as a inhabitant in the natural world. And that's I really like that. I don't want to. Mm -hmm. We are part of this world and we need to take care of it. But I don't want to see myself as this sort of separate thing which needs to preserve but mm -hmm. leave untrammeled all all wilderness. Yeah, I think so. I think. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Um, a lot of folks that don't hunt, I, I gave talks on my book in New York and Boston, Chicago, and all over California, Seattle and Vancouver, in urban areas, right? Big cities. And it was always fun to look at the reaction when I tell them if it wasn't for hound men and hound women, hound handlers, if you will, that cats probably wouldn't even exist in some Western states and rural communities. Um it takes a connection, whether it's for food like deer and elk or for, you know, the, the skill of raising trailing hounds, which is really difficult to do, and being able to chase a lion up a mountain. You know, people see in a tree, that's just the very end of a hunt. Uh, there's a lot more that goes into it years in many cases. Um, 
for legal lion hunting. Um, it takes a special bond for people to care. And I'm going to use Libby, Montana as an example. You know, I used to, there's about 60 to 80, you know, people with hounds that show up at meetings, sometimes more in families. They chase those cats all winter long. You know, deer and elk seasons are done, but they'll chase those cats. They'll name them. They'll take photos of them. They know who has one kitten and two kittens, where an old male is, who's new in the area. They got, you know, they live. For, that's part of their, who they are, the, the fabric of, of their life up there in that deep snow mountain country. It takes that kind of passion to have, uh, you know, and they're typically conservative, rural, local, you know, people to show up at the Capitol and to beat back bad legislation that is poorly thought through, uh, that wants to eliminate native carnivores, for instance, just on a knee jerk reaction. And, and these are, these are people that vote for those, you know, many of the legislators and they're tough. They're, they're hardened in the mountains, men and women and kids show up at these meetings, uh, through time, whether it was the elimination of bounties, whether it was the creation of quotas, whether it was making animals, uh, mountain lions, a big game animal in the Western states, it was a it was the people that hunted them that, that carried the political weight to carry the day. It wasn't the green movement. Mm -hmm. In fact, I look at how men are just as green as the Sierra Club. They just got different personal values. <laughs> the love the the <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and Halman, I, I use Halman loosely. Man, I got dear friends and some of them are are quite the characters. Yeah. I, love, I love that. Uh, uh, that's <laughs> I had one of them tell me if I didn't like you, Jim, I'd throw you in this lake right now at a, at a tri hound trials when I was giving an update. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, and he's I'm, a big guy. Yeah. I'm glad to hear you say that, that uh, hound hunters have played that role because that's what, you know, in the sort of personal histories of houndsmen, there is a, there is this belief that it was the hound hunters who in the 1960s and seventies changed from, and did you know who the, uh, the Lee brothers are? They're sort of famous hound hunters from Southwest Mexico, uh, Southwest Arizona, New Arizona, Mexico. Arizona, New Mexico. So, yeah. Yep, and yep. they're putting out the tapes of uh, the interviews with Dale Lee, one of the brothers on this. And he's hunting in the 30s through the early 60s. Mm -hmm. And he kills every single thing he catches. <laughs> yeah. And oh, yeah. and that was no doubt the way uh, of, that predators were managed or not managed for the first half of the 20th century. But it's my perception. Uh, and I think this is the perception among houndsmen that that changed and houndsmen bought into conserving this thing that they love so much. So I'm glad to hear you affirm yeah. that that is part of the story. And back in the day in the 30s, you got to remember that people, you know, in this country, we were still trying to to recover and and regain, you know, deer and elk herds. We didn't have them. They were shot out with with settle the settlement of the West. Right. Um pretty much by white pod hunters right you know there but it, 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 there was no game laws really in some cases so the mindset back then was you know the things with teeth and claws you take them out to get things with hooves that you can eat and uh, yeah that all changed in fact morris hornocker of idaho fame he lives near you down the road mm -hmm. um, his research was the catalyst that all the hound clubs in the west started looking at going huh huh and 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 uh you know at the halls of academia Rod and gun clubs that, you know, lions are a little different than what Morris discovered back in that Idaho wilderness is the first one. You know, lions are a little different than we thought. And we need to be a little careful here if we want to keep them around. What did what did he discover? That number one, there there wasn't a thousand cats in a district that they are. They have home range sizes of females, you know, 80 to 100 square miles on the large end, a male 150 that, you know, they actually were kind of territorial. You know, when he looked at it, you, you know, the, they would, the home ranges would overlap females and males, but not all the time and not at the same time. Um, and essentially uh, he, he figured out, you know, we need to put a quote on here. You kill too many females, the population's going to, going to suffer and your, your, your overall number is going to go down. If you care about cats and you're a hound person, uh, you should know that. And so, and we've learned more and Mark Elbrock now is probably uh, one of the most uh famous lion researchers, publishers, and he's in Washington on the Olympic Cougar Project. He works for Panthera. Um, he's got cameras out. He's taken it to a new level and he's finding cats sharing, you know, multiple adults sharing food on some cameras. So there's, they're a little more social than we thought too, but you're not going to have them stacked in there like cordwood, you know, like if you yeah. let it to your herd just grow and grow and grow. And so that changed the minds of a lot of state legislatures, state fish and wildlife commissions that, okay, they're not going to eliminate the elk herd. They're not going to eliminate the deer herd. They have an impact, but you know, if these hound uh, hound men and women want them and 
want to pursue them, yeah, yeah, maybe we can make them a game animal and not have a bounty on them anymore. Mm-hmm. And that was all because of hound handlers. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, is Mark Elbrock cougar conundrum? Yes. Yeah, I, I endorse the back of his book, actually. Okay, he, so he I, from... I read it as well. And uh, I, I, I'd I need someone like you to talk to him because yeah. I, w- I would just want to argue. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. and it Mark was, loved that. Mark it didn't liked... seem like the middle way to me. Yeah, Mark, Mark is extremely bright, and he likes to challenge State Fish and Wildlife Agency for a lack, primarily a lack of of inclusivity and decision making and he's right there it's primarily white males in most fish and wildlife rod and gun clubs and i actually you look around you know they're older white males you know i I worry about the future until backcountry hunters and anglers came along they're full of men and women and they're young and they're meeting in brew pubs they're they're very vital very engaged right but prior to that boy the hunting community was maturing pretty rapidly, right? And the and the meetings are pretty small. So Mark's challenge, and we've um, debated, you know, had fun um, discussing that. How do we as hunters share decision making at the table, the commissions, with people that with just women, much low, much less um, another gender, much less another race, or someone who doesn't believe in hunting how do we share that decision making power so his whole theme in that book is well he's got the biology in there he's top-notch scientist but he likes to poke and make you think that there isn't much inclusivity in 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 managing a uh, big game not just lions so that that from that's just my opinion but that that's why i enjoyed it because it does make you think you know it's okay. like okay you know. The, the, yeah sometimes those hard books are the yep. the ones which make you think I, I felt like it was the political slant was so strongly uh, opposing mine that it was at yeah. times, you know, it, it, it's difficult to interact. Yeah, with Mark's, information. Mark's a hunter and, you know, and, and he's a dad and, and uh, he's a friend of mine. And, but he's also very good at, at, at you know, thought provoking discussions mm-hmm. and challenging the status quo, which frankly, as hunters and as carnivore hunters, you know, we're going to need that right to, to stay relevant and and maintain that privilege into the future how are we and that's a and and that's i've always struggled with that too as hunters how do we become more inclusive and at not necessarily hunting but at the decision making table of who gets to take what and that's the fish and wildlife commissions Mm -hmm. yeah and i don't have an answer yeah that's for young folks like you Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah no it's hard uh so there's a sort of I felt like one of the fundamental dynamics of your book was this relationship between being an outsider and being a local in places, yeah. whether it was when you first moved to Montana and you're <laughs> getting in bar fights or when you go down to Patagonia and you're talking with this Leoneros and they're like these hard leathery uh, Patagonian lion hunters who live to stack up lion heads. Uh, it, and and partially this relates to what we we're just talking about with Mark Elbrook. You know, how do we involve now? There's many stakeholders. Uh, you know, uh, outside of outside of the area that these things are taking place. For instance, you know, Portland decides what Oregon does to some extent. And how do we balance that yeah. conversation between the locals who say? You out there don't understand what's going on in here. I think rightfully so. The deep, the closer you are to a place, the better you understand it to some extent. But also the fact that we live in a democracy where every, you know, everyone in Oregon has a vote, you know. And that, you know, yet that's a good point. So Mark talks about local collaboratives. He uses an example, one chapter of a of a lion working group in Missoula. I was actually set in on those as well. Um, and I think if we broaden if, if we make the tent a little bit larger and invite some of the Portland, Seattle values in, in a locally led collaborative group, and that's what I do now with the land trust. There's lots of locally led groups that ranchers lead with land trusts on land conservation and issues, right? I think the group carries a lot of power back to a, a capital in, in, in LA, a capital in, in Oregon, a capital in Washington, because you had a bigger tent. You had some values on there that are similar to what's in the urban areas, but the group came to, you know, give and take and, and came with a recommendation. It's going to carry. And I think that'll save hunting in some instances, but it's very difficult to invite 
people that don't agree with you or that aren't like you into a decision-making, a power sharing environment, right? And, but we have to do that. And it has to have, particularly with carnivore, bear and lion hunting and wolf. Yeah. Wolf, wolves are different. Wolves are off the charts. Boy, people's brains turn off when it comes to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's why my hair is gray. You know, yeah. it was blonde yeah. before wolves took off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jim, do you need to go at four or can we keep talking? Yeah, let's keep five minutes. minutes. Okay. Uh, so <sighs> what were we we're talking about? Uh, oh, yeah, the urban values. I think we need to. So we need to figure out a way to get uh, a, a more diverse group. Uh, and to make hunting type recommendations and then it'll it'll mitigate some of the anti uh hunting values in in the in the capitals where the decisions are made because they know uh that you'll have champions that aren't necessarily hunters in that group that brings those recommendations forward and that'll carry weight the same way Hellman carried weight you know and from a rural and local perspective you know in montana in a more rural state yeah, it it seems uh, it seems to be about reaching out, and and I like bringing more people into the tent. Uh, the the animal rights groups we call them animal rights groups. I don't know what to call yeah. them. The side yeah. which yeah. essentially yeah. wants no hunting, uh, you, you know, not just predator hunting. I I think the end goal, I, there really is a sort of uh, extreme perspective on on both sides, but on that side is you know, to the point that meat should not be allowed. And, you know, we're a long yeah. ways from that and it's not going to happen. But now, some uh, of that's nonsensical. I mean, I grew up in, far, I was born farm country of Iowa. You know, humans eat, they, they need food, right? And not everyone's right. going to be a vegetarian. We're going to eat meat. But and, I think uh, behind these big animal rights organizations, it's it, it's not, those are not crazy ideas there. Although the public will is not there. Uh, yeah. The The fear of the hunting community is that, okay, well, we bring more people into the tent. We start, you know changing things to make it more acceptable for mm -hmm. portland and there's this fear of death by a thousand cuts a slippery slope to you know first it will be trapping then it, and, and to some extent it is happening right it might be yeah. happening oh, yeah. regardless of what we do but uh there's a fear that any concession will be you know is the beginning of the end and how do yeah. we navigate that I, I agree but that's that's kind of a dangerous position to take because like in california you already lost it in in oregon and washington you've lost half of it you know mm -hmm. and so there's really that, that there's really no risk there's only gains that could happen maybe to get a little bit of that back right and a and a trial uh basis um i hear you it's i think for deer and elk hunting you know this this movement toward farm to table and chemical Free meats is the best thing, you know. All these kids, men and women, and people from big cities, all want to kill a deer now and take adult hunter ed. I think it's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I, like you know, when as hunters, when we uh, often our hands are the only thing that touches that deer or elk from the time it dies to the time it's processed in the field to the time it's cut up to the time you bear it, carry it out to the time you wrap it, label it, and stick it in the freezer, all the way until you serve it to friends and family. Only your fingers have touched that animal compared to you know, industrial cattle and other meats that have hormones and chemicals or whatever, you yeah. know? Uh, and, and so there's a real demand, a real desire to connect to nature that way for younger, uh, younger demographics to get their own food. And I think that's that, that is incredibly powerful to keep hunting as a legal management tool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. What, what do you think about the Patagonia approach to conservation? You talk about this in your mm -hmm. book. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's a totally different um, environment down there. You know, it, you don't really have public lands per se. You have park or private. You have large ranches that were owned um, by European, um, you know, conglomerates, ownerships. And in the case of the Tompkins parks, a lot of those were mining conglomerates that Doug and Chris Tompkins over time purchased either ranches, assemblages of ranches, or these big properties that are owned by European or, or non uh, Chilean or non-Argentina landowners, and it was very controversial, right? You know, is he creating a uh, an American state in Patagonia? Is he trying to hoard water? You know, oh, you got accused of everything. Um, and then in the end, you know, he he passed. He died in a kayaking accident down there on a lake like Flathead Lake, real dangerous lake. Um, in the end, both Argentina and chile i think made him an honorary citizen it's just a shame you couldn't see that chris did um they gave the parks all back they spent all that time their entire personal fortunes all their energy blood sweat and tears 
hired local staffs in Argentina and Chile, created a trust to carry it and gave every property back to the country. And that's important because in Chile and Argentina, you don't have the public lands like you do here, the in-between forest service, BLM, state lands. All you have is a park or a ranch. And most of the ranches are outfitted European hunters, American hunters that come down, you know, Mm -hmm. and there's not the tradition of firearm ownership like we have and a lot of the 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 rights that we enjoy in this country. So those parks down there are going to be incredible. People are going to get local Argentine families, local Chilean families. They're going to get married near them in the communities near. The communities are going to prosper with, with amenities, you know, for visitors. They're breathtaking parks. They're striking. It's like the United States Rocky Mountains on steroids and mm. even more remote. Whoa. And what they've done, in my mind, is, is as significant as any of the major land conservation movements here in the United States. Mm-hmm. And they did it with their own money. And yeah. Patagonia, the clothing company, Yvonne and Melinda Chenard, there are, there's a group of them that all work together. So, and those parts, those pieces of land have gone back to the Argentinian and Chilean mm-hmm. governments now. All of them. Yep. Wow. Okay. Gave it away. Uh, the uh, I... My the sort of idealistic part of me is scared of that because what I love so much about the public land system here is that it's democratic and like we all have an equal stake in it. I'm I'm reluctant to rely upon billionaires to you know conserve for us because I think it's a fundamentally undemocratic idea. But pragmatically, it's achieved something which is great and it's it's done a very good thing. How, Very controversial, right? <laughs> yeah, we've we've got sort of similar things going on here with things like, well, the Wilkes brothers are on one side of the equation. Warren Buffett's somewhere in the middle where he continually promises to give his money away, but for now he'll do the best with it. And something like the Na- Nature Conservancy or the American Prairie Reserve is on the other. And it seems like a a, a difficult spectrum to navigate. How How do we move on that? Yeah, I think, you know, we don't have a choice. Um, and so that's my new career since I retired from Fish, Alive, and Parks. I work for the Heart of the Rockies Initiative. Mm-hmm. We have 27 land trust members in from Jackson Hole to Sun Valley, north to Banff, right? In mm-hmm. Golden, BC. Land trusts are the unsung heroes in conservation. They are doing land conservation, keeping working families on the land, uh, ranches, which means fish and wildlife remain, um, with willing property owners Those ranchers are exercising their property right to do a conservation easement. Um, And sometimes there's a tax benefit. Sometimes there's not. Sometimes there's finances, a benefit. Sometimes there's not. They're doing it for the right reason. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the model. The pace of conservation to protect those open lands needs to really increase. And it's not climate change. It's humans. Uh, Since the pandemic, the Rockies have experienced um, three different migrations. COVID refugees fled the big cities and wanted to, to come where people live laterally in the landscape versus vertically. Right. Um, the, the climate migrants, when California, Oregon and Washington caught on fire, you know, a lot of people with the wealth that could came to the Rockies. And then um, when the riots started, you know, in Portland and Seattle and everywhere throughout the country, you had a lot of people that had the the, the wherewithal to pack up and move to come where they felt safer. So those three in migrations in in the prime wildlife habitats of the Northern and Central Rockies are very significant. The pressure to subdivide has never been greater. So I think as hunters, we need to support all, getting back to your question, all vehicles of keeping open space, whether there's access or not, you can always negotiate access down the road, whether it's a Wilkes Brothers or whether it's American Prairie Reserve. On really? Of, whether it's the Wilkes Brothers? If they put a conservation easement on a property, support it, I'd say. You can negotiate the access down the road. Because you might hunt a bull elk that was raised on their property that moved off on public land where you can't hunt. Right? Right. Versus if they subdivided them, sold them to the highest bidder, then, then we're all going to lose. But that the key is if they put a conservation easement, right? Or as long as they keep it undeveloped. And that's a tough thing. That's a trust thing. That's what you're getting at. And I I agree, man. I'm nervous too. But open lands, keeping those working families on the land is critical to fish and wildlife in the West. And that's why I'm excited to work with these land trusts to give everything I have left, you know, energy-wise in my career, mm-hmm. you know, to helping them work with these private property owners to keep open space for fish and wildlife. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. I really appreciate your time, man. Uh, and if you 
if you ever want to do it again, I've got heaps more things to ask you. Yeah, about. yeah, yeah. No, I've, it's fine. We can do it. Think of another thing. Or if I come down there, I'll do it in person. I'll let you know if I met Brian Beans. And yeah. my title is you inter- you can introduce me as I was a wildlife biologist, regional wildlife program manager, and regional supervisor for 31 years with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Yep. I'm currently the partnerships manager of the Heart of the Rockies initiative. Okay. And then you have to say... Heart of the Rockies supports land trust because people don't know what that is. <laughs> okay, well, let me write that down to Heart of the Rockies supports land trust. Yeah, you can go. Yeah, Heart of the Rock. It's on the website. Heart of, Heart of the Rockies initiative. Yep. And and we have twenty seven land trusts. We and Nature Conservancy Trust for Public Lands are a member. You know, and it's it's all about land keeping it open, and that's a big deal. <laughs> you know, yeah. No, when, we're dead, totally. when we're dead and gone, those those projects are still here. Yeah. No. Totally. I I, I get that. It's the you know yeah. there's a slight discomfort where there's a question of like different cultural values and oh, yeah. oh well then it's good that the nature conserve is open but they're fine with fishing and maybe duck but, hunting but you can't but down the, the road we might get there that's yeah. what you can't okay. do is close the door because that the residential uh the put the footprint of a residential subdivision is permanent yep the 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 no access signs are not those those can be opened up, but it's going to take work, but they can be opened up. And and I, I would, I, I'm not willing to give those up yet. <laughs> good, good. Awesome. Thank you, man. That was really positive. Cool. Take well, care. Hey, yeah, look, send me a link when you get it done. I want, I'll be curious. Yeah, it'll be fun to listen. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, man. See ya. Bye.